Hey, and welcome back. I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to everyone that recently subscribed to my channel. I actually not going to do 1,000 subs. I'm going to do 2,000 because I got 1,000 subscribers really fast. Uh, I got a big push from the algorithm or from YouTube. From the algorithm. Anyways, I got a big push over the Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, it's, it's still going now, so I've been getting a lot of subscribers and a lot of views. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And uh, thank you to the algorithm. Can I thank code? Or is it code? Anyways, thanks. All right, so I picked up another rusty gem. It's a Rockwell 11 by 24 lathe. And on the data plate, it says that it's special. How is it special? I don't really know. What I do know is that it has a taper attachment and it has a one and a half inch spindle bore. So I'm thinking it's one or both of those is what makes it special. It's in pretty good condition despite the rust. I know what you're thinking. It looks like hell. But it's really not that bad. The spindle's free. The carriage is free and the cross light is free. The tail stock, on the other hand, is not free. Hey, and who doesn't like a flame hardened bed? So, a nice touch on the taper attachment is that it has a built in magnifying glass so you can see that really small scale. Those should be built into anything that has really small scales, if you ask me. I like on the data plate that they put it has an 11 and 1 16th inch swing just in case you weren't sure you know that you can make it. Fortunately the headstock was spared the trauma of the rust. It's a little dirty but it's in really good condition and I got a steady rest and a drive plate and there's a four jaw chuck that I'm pretty sure has never been used. Take note of that oxidation. I stopped at a pressure washer on the way home and blasted it one time because the chip tray had a serious uh, funkage going on and uh, that needed to go. I've already stripped everything off of the bed so we can focus more on putting it back together. Just rolling it outside to give it the purple power treatment. I did it three times and I think if I did it a fourth I would have had issues with the paint. You just got to be careful with uh, how long it sits on the surface and keeping it wet, especially. So I'm using a little bit different logic on the lathe than I did for the milling machine. On the milling machine, I was just all in from the get-go. I knew that everything was going to get done. But with this machine, uh, it hasn't been repainted. And believe it or not, the paint is really not that bad. It, it does have some rust issues, but... Um, I think I can get past most of that. There are some things that I'll probably wind up having to totally repaint. But you'll see that in the end, uh, I think it's going to look pretty good. It's going to be a, a mixture of uh, kind of shabby chic, if you will, for a lathe. I know that's the wrong term to use, but uh, you get the idea. I hate that kind of paint. Normally I'll reach for the spray gun before I do anything else, but in this case, one thing is I didn't want to separate the lathe bed from the base um, because of the way the headstock, the belts are. I didn't want to completely disassemble it because I didn't need to. And then the other thing is the chip tray is pretty severely pitted and the inside of the lathe bed needs to get repainted as well and it's just such a tight confined space it's very difficult to spray uh, even with a touch-up gun so believe it or not the roller was a really good solution it was better than using a paintbrush there's no brush strokes it does look a little lumpy but it also looks lumpy from pitting as well so in the end I think it turns out
You can see that the chip tray's got the first coat on it and I went and scuffed it. I did go to the big box store and hunt down a small diameter foam roller. They can be difficult to find so you gotta do some digging. But that did uh, work pretty good for doing the final coat on the chip tray. It went a lot smoother and it was a little bit easier to manage um, underneath the lathe bed. It was a little bit difficult to use the bigger rollers so it, it helped out a lot. All right, so remember that oxidation I asked you to pay attention to? Well, you can see it's pretty well gone. The purple power is taking care of it. There's still a little bit left there, but the wax takes care of the rest. I put two heavy coats of wax on it, and uh, the, the paint was just absorbing it like crazy. I had to keep rubbing it in because the, the paint was so dry that it was absorbing the wax. And uh, as you can see later on, it uh, turns out pretty good considering what it did look like. Next up is installing the VFD. I wanted it to be inside the cabinet and away from my shelf, so I put that square there just as a reference. Hey, check out that shiny paint. So that first hole, I just kind of guessed at, and then once I had it figured out, I indexed the other three holes off of it, and then of course I flipped it around and mounted it on the inside of the cabinet. There's no room to work inside the cabinet, so that's why I'm doing it on the outside. The cabinet is eighth inch sheet metal, and I'm using 1032 screws to mount the VFD with. So there's the VFD mounted in a dead space. There's no access to that area, so it doesn't make any sense to try and extend the shelf or do anything else with it. It's in a, a good spot. It's protected. And do you know how hard it is to index a square to a circle in free space? So you can see there that I drew out a circle on that plate uh, after center marking it, and that gave me a guide to be able to reference those plates and uh, gave me a place to mount my glands and there you can see the main power cable is attached to the switch and then the switch runs back to the VFD on the underside of the shelf and that gland hole is for the control box when I first started working on the lathe the selector level was jammed and the collar that I'm cleaning on right there is actually the support for the back gear shaft on the the back side of the headstock and there's a bushing on the front side of the headstock that it goes into well that bushing doesn't have any means of lubricating it and so what happened was you can see that this lever every time you you move it the back gear shaft uh, gets higher and higher because it's riding on a cam or eccentric and what that means is, is that this lathe probably never got put into back gear. It just got left in direct drive all the time. And it allowed the bushing on the front side to lock up the back gear shaft. So what I had to do was remove that collar on the back and take a brass drift and tap on the back gear shaft and move it back and forth uh, and go to the front, of course, and tap. And it only has about a quarter inch of movement there and eventually I was able to get it freed up and I got enough oil in between the shaft and the bushing to make everything start working again um, but it's all connected together so if you don't move that selector lever uh, or if you have a Rockwell lathe that's getting stiff that that lever is getting stiff you need to investigate that bushing on the front side of your headstock and uh, give it some lubrication and I'll point it out uh, later when it comes up that's all the mechanism right there for the the lockout um, it basically 
uh, either allows it to be in direct drive or in free spindle or lock spindle or back gear. The rear spindle bearing housing was pretty grungy and it has a sealed bearing in it um, and it has a couple of bolt holes in the housing that allow you to press it out against the, the headstock housing. So I just uh, popped it out of there and cleaned it up. There is a small brass grub in this locking collar underneath the set screw that, that locks it to the spindle shaft and it just keeps it from marring the spindle shaft threads. So the spindle is a L00 spindle. Um, that taper should make this be a very accurate lathe. Um, and behind it, the front spindle bearing is a giant uh, cone bearing. So I, I didn't want to take any of that apart if I didn't need to. I just popped the cover off and took a look at it. And fortunately, it was clean. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, debris or, or rust or anything behind that plate. Um, and just cleaned it up a little bit and made sure that the grease fitting would take grease and I could see grease squeezing out uh, of the bearing whenever I did that. So I just put it back together and called it good after a little cleanup. The bushing I'm lubricating there is the front of the back gear shaft, which is what was seized initially, uh, wouldn't allow the selector lever to move. So again, I took the cover off the back of the back gear shaft support there and just tapped the back gear back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until that freed up inside that bushing. Um, I actually need to figure out a way to um, be able to get an oil passageway into that bushing. I don't, I don't want to take the entire headstock apart to do that, um, but it would be nice if it had an oil passage uh, directly into that bushing um, to be able to just very easily lubricate it and uh, not have to uh, monkey around with it. it. It does slide back about an eighth of an inch whenever you move the selector lever. It uh, has a little bit of of gap there so it allows you to to shoot some oil around the the lip if you will and then uh, it works its way onto the shaft so that worked and it's freed up but again if you got a sticky lever that's your problem so again this is the safety lockout mechanism it keeps you from doing anything um, that you shouldn't do it keeps you from destroying the lathe basically um, but it is very tricky to get adjusted just right because of that spring you've got to get it set dead on center which is kind of difficult to do and uh, I'll save you the four or five times that I took it apart and put it back together again in order to get that just just perfect so that uh, it would work the way it's supposed to so it is a little bit tricky to get adjusted but once it's right it's right and then there's a, a tension adjuster on the other side that 
determines how uh, difficult it is to pull the handle out and push it back in. Um, it just kind of sets a preload on it. So all the way to the left is direct drive and all the way to the right is back gear. That's lock spindle so that you can do chuck changes and that's free spindle. So I haven't powered this motor up yet and I just want to spin it up and see if the bearings are making any noise and they are. And of course, once again, another failed rear bearing. The way this motor is mounted inside of the cabinet, the electrical box is against the back wall and it's impossible to get to once it's installed. So I went ahead and pre-terminated everything and I've got my whole wire roll just hanging off the end of the bench there. Once I get it mounted inside the cabinet, I'll terminate it at the VFD. Hey, it's alive, the first run, and of course it's running in reverse and forward. I had to switch two of the legs to make it run the right way. And there'll probably be two or three more videos related to this lathe. Thanks for watching.